see you. Sister Kay Garman here, of course, and I'm here with our, about our Thanksgiving dinners. As you can see, I have the turkeys and there went a can of corn. So we don't want that going nowhere, do we? But this is, I brought one last week. You know, it really sticks to people's mind about my turkeys because they remember the turkeys. And I'll say, you remember what the turkeys is for? Uh, let me think. It's for Thanksgiving dinners that we're going to be giving out. And this week we were supposed to bring the green beans and the corn, the preacher which he has. And I have a basket out front. You bring the vegetables, canned goods, or whatever. Each week we have different things. You can bring all of it at one time. You can bring a couple each time. But we, we do give these families dinners the, the, the Monday before Thanksgiving. We give out the dinners for the families that is in need to have a turkey dinner. And that's what we want to do. We here at Remedy, we want to minister. And if you know anyone this, this is Thanksgiving that will need a dinner, just contact me and tell me. Just say, Sister Kay, I need a dinner. If it's for you or for your family member or for your neighbor, whoever it may be that's in need, just say, and give me your name. And then we give the dinners out. And what I want to know is the name and how many is in the family because we do want to minister. So you're going to be seeing me with my turkeys. And if anybody wants to see my turkeys after church, I'll let them see my turkeys after church. So I've got them. And each week you're going to see a different turkey, I hope. And one of these Sunday mornings, we're going to have a live gobbler up here. <laughs> I'm looking at Brother Ron. I'm hoping he gets strong enough. <laughs> We're going to have a live gobbler, and we're going to have a big, uh, over six-foot turkey up here, believe it or not. So look forward to the turkeys, but not just remember the turkeys. The church usually furnishes the turkeys. That's why I bring my turkeys. And we let you bring all the fixes to go with it. So each week, there's a basket right out there in that hallway. You put your stuff in the basket, and we collect it all and put it all together. And all the food goes out. We do not keep anything. Every bit of it goes out to families. So God bless you, and hope you have a great day today. Take my turkey. <laughs> Liberty Church, good morning. house this morning. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When you walk in the back, we got people passing out uh, uh, brochures this morning. It's, uh, uh, and it's got a pamphlet in the back. And it says, uh, what is it? Prayer. Prayer card. Prayer card. Excuse me. Pastor card, prayer card. You know, to me, it's all PC to me. And uh, if you're first time visitor, if you're here, welcome. We're glad you came. Uh, we pray that you feel loved, and uh, if you could just take a few moments and, and write something down, just fill out the card and pass it in. It's a good way for us to keep in touch with you. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, I'm glad and I'm excited about being in God's house this morning, and uh, and as I was praying this week, God had laid something specific on my heart, and I want to share it with you. Is that okay? Um, and, and for parents that have kids, sometimes you understand that sometimes when you're praying and your kids are involved, sometimes it just gets a little crazy because they just, you know, get in the mix. So the other morning I was in my living room and, and Zayden, my, my the Omega, was uh, he was in he was in the living room uh, watching TV, Bubble Guppies or something. I don't know one of them shows. So I, I was knelt down and I was praying on the couch and I was calling out to God and I was just telling God how much I loved him and. And it must have caught Satan's attention because what he did, he, he stopped watching TV and he came up beside me. And what he did was, and it was really cool how God worked because the scripture that came to my mind before he came over there, it says that if I draw unto you, God, then you'll draw unto me. And he's our heavenly father. And what Satan did, he literally climbed up in the couch and got right down from where I was kneeling. And the cool thing about that is I had to stop and I had to pay attention to my child. 
can I tell you this morning, if you would stop being distracted by TV and stop being distracted by whatever situation that's around you, and you would put your full attention on God, God in himself will come down in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of your situation, and he would begin to minister to you. But the problem that we have is that we get so distracted with life and with things that we, we tend not to focus on Jesus. But I know a one. I know a God that no matter where you're coming from, no matter what's going on, that if you just call out of the hand, the Bible declares, if you draw out to him, he will draw out to you. If you can't remedy, let's get up on your feet this morning. We're going to welcome his presence in here. We're going to stop worrying. We're going to stop being distracted by what's going on in the next 30 minutes. Right now is the time that you're going to give to Jesus. So whoever's beside you, look at him and say, neighbor, I'm about to worship. Don't mess with me. Heavenly Father, you are welcome in this house. You are welcome in this place, Lord God. I pray, God, that you will break this house with your anointing. That you will break it with your glory. Fill this house with your love, your compassion, and your fear, your love, God, as we welcome your presence in this house, God. I give you full power and authority in this house, God. Have your way, God, in the name of Jesus.
do it by ourselves and we don't have to do it alone. We just need to give it to Him. The enemy has been defeated. Death couldn't hold you down. We're going to lift our voice in victory. We're going to make your praise. Hallelujah. The enemy has been defeated.
God, we give you glory in this place. God, I pray that victory would walk into the room this morning for someone. Yes. That someone would see victory walk into the room this morning. For our circumstances, our situations, Father, we hand them to you, God. Every phase, every stage, whatever we're experiencing this morning, God, we give it to you. And we know that our enemies have been defeated. God, we know that we serve you. You're all powerful, you're all knowing. We just give it to you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated this morning. Church. Is this your first time with us? Please fill out the prayer card attached to the bulletin that you received on your way into the sanctuary. We believe that God hears us when we pray, and we want to partner with you to see God move in your life. Turn the prayer card into the Connect Center located in the front lobby, and you'll receive a free Remedy Church t-shirt for each member of your family. Come and join in on the fun on October 28th from 3.30 to 7.30 p.m. for a night of wholesome family fun that will include a trunk or treat, hay rides, face painting, free food, and so much more. If your last name begins with a letter between H and J, please remember to sign your family up for our next pastor's breakfast next Sunday. This ministry will give you insight on our church vision as well as how to step into God's purpose for your life. Do you love meeting new people? Is your favorite greeting a high five or a smile that lights up the room? If so, see Daniel Bryant to take this opportunity to be a part of our awesome First Impressions team, meet new people, and serve God's kingdom. We're having Thanksgiving dinner on November 19th here at Remedy Church. Come join us to celebrate God and one another in a time of fellowship. The event will begin at 5.30 in the cafe. Please make plans now to be a part of Christmas at Remedy by attending our Christmas program, Our Coming Savior. Invite your family and friends to participate in one of two opportunities to worship in a service of music, skits, and candle lighting on Saturday, December 23rd at 6 p.m. or Sunday, December 24th at 10.45 a.m. All right, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for what He's doing at church. Welcome. Welcome to Remedy Church this morning. We're so glad that you're here today. And uh, if it's your first time with us, as we said in the video announcement, you probably received a bulletin on your way through. You'll just fill that out at the end of service. You can stop by the Connect Center on your way out and grab a free t-shirt. And uh, we'd love to, to partner with you in prayer and see God move in your life. How many of you believe that prayer still works today? We're a church that believes that, that when we pray, God hears us. When, when we pray that He answers, that He's a God that's alive and well today. I can be excited about the fact that I don't serve a dead God who can't hear me when I pray. But I serve a God that's alive and He hears me and He knows my need. Some of you have been in here and, and, and you're worshiping because God has saved you from something. You remember where you were when you got saved. And so if you're wondering why people are exuberant in here this morning and why people are going crazy when they're worshiping, it's because you might not know their story today of what God saved them from. And it might not be able, you might not be able to communicate that, but I'm going to tell you right now, eternity is coming. And one day when heaven or hell come to meet you, you're going to understand what worship like that means for somebody. To say that God saved my soul, He saved my body, even though it's dying and perishing, He saved me out of a situation that I didn't know how to handle. I was lost and didn't know where I was going, but thank God He saw me where I was. Do I have any worshipers in the building this morning? So I'm convinced this creations of God were designed to be connected to God. I believe God he has a desire for each and every person that He's ever created in His image to know and experience His love for us in every way that we can possibly imagine. Just look around you. You see the, the love of God in His people. You see it 
uh, in all of creation. You see it by the interactions day to day that you have. God is present with you, whether you know it or not. My job this morning is not to convince you of something that you don't want to believe. My job this morning is to tell you the truth about Jesus Christ. That He lived, that He died, and that He was resurrected. It's your job to decide, am I going to choose to believe the truth, or am I going to continue living a lie? Because one day the truth will come to you. And you need to know that God desires for you to be connected to His kingdom. This is a great place to be connected to His kingdom. Remedy Church is an awesome place full of, full of awesome, imperfect, flawed, messed up individuals that the only difference between us and someone who hasn't come to know Jesus yet is the blood that He applied to our lives. And we've accepted His grace. There's no difference between you and me. I can stand behind a pulpit, but it doesn't matter if I can put on whatever face that I need to put on behind a pulpit. If I don't go out and live the life that He's called me to live. I was a broken man before Jesus came to me. I was somebody that needed something from something greater than me. I needed to know that I was designed for purpose. He came in and He changed me. He can do it for you today. He can do that for you today. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. We have it on the screen, or we will shortly. Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. This is a story that's familiar to a lot of people, but I don't want to assume that everybody knows the story this morning of Acts chapter 16, but we find two men, one by the name of Paul, one by, by the name of Silas. And I want to tell you a little bit about their story today. But I want to read this, this scripture, and I want you to keep it in the back of your mind. It says this in verse 25, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. They were in jail singing these hymns. Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prison fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open and he assumed the prisoners had escaped so he drew his sword to kill himself. God add blessing to your word this morning. You know, we've been in a sermon series called Under Pressure. We've been talking about our emotions. Last last time we talked, it's been two weeks ago, so if you're here for the first time today, you're getting a, a, a pastor that's not preached in two weeks. So, uh, you know, just hang, hang tight. I'm kidding. Um, so, we've been talking about different emotions, and, and really we put it in terms of the emotions that drive us to our knees. Um, emotions that are heavy on us. Emotions that... Uh, make us feel like we can't make it. Emotions that, that mess with us to a place where our life is not everything that God intended for it to be. And we talked about anxiety the last time that we were together uh, two weeks ago. Today, I want to talk to you about depression. I want to talk to you about depression. I, I'm, there's, there are a lot of degree, varying degrees of depression. And let me say this before I get started this morning. I don't want anyone to feel like I'm belittling a situation if somebody is dealing with uh, depression. Um, there, there are varying degrees that can go all the way from clinical depression where uh, people have to, you know, take medication and, and deal with it that way. And thank God for the different things that God has brought for us to be able to, to do that, okay? But uh, there, there are also times where um, we go through our day-to-day -day of unnecessary depression where our soul gets downcast. Where something happens in our life and it depresses us, it pushes us down, and it makes us feel like less than God created us to be. Uh, depression attacks in a lot of ways, but I, I want to talk to you about that this morning. And, and you say, well, I don't see anything about depression in this story. I'm going to give you a backstory in just a minute. But what I want to say to you is that I, I truly am convinced that God's creations, every single part of His creation was created to be connected. You sitting in here today, you were created to be connected to God and to His kingdom. You were created to be connected to the Creator of all things and uh, other creations as well. Bro we call them brothers and sisters in Christ. That's kind of an old church term. And uh, you're hearing it less and less, but it's truly what we are, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we say that because we are now blood-related because Jesus Christ's blood has been placed upon our lives. And so we consider ourselves family, the family of God. The Bible says that we, we are adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. And so I, I believe that we're created and we're destined to be connected to the King and His kingdom. I believe that we're created to be connected to one another. And everything that we see shows that. What I also know is that we have an enemy. 
We have a foe. He wants nothing more than for us to believe Him when He tells us that we were created for something different than what God says. Looking back to the Garden of Eden, uh, you, you take Adam and Eve's story, and his, his objective, the enemy's objective, the devil's objective, was to convince even Adam uh, that, that, that they were something different or something less than what God had said they were, which was good. When God laid everything out he, and He created everything, after He created it, He looked at it and he, what did He say? He said, it's good. He created Adam. He said, it's good. And He said, it's not, it's not good for man to be alone. That's how I know we're created to be connected. It, it, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. And he, he created Eve and He said that she was good. And, they, and he, he tells them, uh, be fruitful and multiply that you have dominion over all the earth. And they go and they're, they're, they're going about their business in the garden. And he, he gives them rules and he says, you know what? You can eat of any tree in the garden except for this one tree. Don't eat from it. And lo and behold, you find an Eve who is standing in front of this tree. And, and, and a serpent creeps down out of the, the, the leaves and the branches of the tree. And he starts to speak to her and he starts to, to tell her. Uh, now, this is a, a Pastor Cody paraphrase, PCP version. Okay. Uh, you, you, you can't eat from that tree? She says, no, God says that if I eat from the tree, that I'll surely die. He says, you surely won't die. And he says something that is, it is haunted the human race from this moment forward. He said, God's just afraid that you'll be like him if you eat of that tree. He deceived her. His objective and his goal was to get her to think that what God had presented for her life was not enough. That what God had presented for her life and who she was, how He designed her, and how He... They said Adam was with her, so man, we don't get out of this one either. Adam was with her, and He, he, he convinced Adam and Eve to think that, that what God had designed them to be was not enough. And He said, you need to eat of the tree. This is basically what He was saying. He didn't come out and say it because it never, He never comes out and says it. He tries to deceive you into doing what He wants you to do. He, he said, he, he said you just, you'll be like God if you eat that tree. So the humanity of Adam and Eve rose up within them, and, and, and they started to believe the lie that the, 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 the devil had told them. They started to believe that their design wasn't enough. They, they lived in perfection. They lived in a glorified body. They lived in, in, in better situations than any of us have ever known. They walked with God in the cool of the evening. And in that process, somewhere along the way, they thought about an instant where maybe this could be better. And they bought into the lie and the deception. They came from Satan. He tried to convince them that their state was not the best thing that they could, could experience. He was trying to convince them that if they indulged in the lust of the tree that God had forbidden, that they would experience a life on a greater level than they currently were. Here's the deal. As soon as they believed in what he was saying, he used their mistake against them. And what God had said was good, he twisted and he made them ashamed of. So we see Adam and Eve and and. They're in the garden, and they partake of the tree, and they eat of the tree that God said not to eat from. And, and they had this expectation that if I eat this, I'll be like God. But instantly, the opposite effect happened, and they go to hide among the bushes because they were ashamed, because they were naked. And here comes God, and God says, where are you, Adam? Such a deep and profound question. I don't have time to get into it today. But he says, where are you, Adam? And Adam said, I'm here, Lord. And he said, why are you hiding? He asked him, why are you hiding? Well, because I'm naked. And God asked him, and he said, who told you that you were naked? You see, there was something that shifted in the mind of Adam and Eve when they, when they bought into the lie that the enemy told them. They disconnected from God. And they disconnected from His creation in the way that God created it to be. And they found themselves in a place where they felt isolated and ashamed. The story was completely different now. So in a battle for our soul, we experience attacks from the enemy. It causes us at times to be downcast. Has anybody ever felt that? It causes us at times to, to be sad, to be depressed, to be lonely, to be anxious. And the attacks he sends our way causes us to experience moments of emotions. He takes a, a good creation of emotions that God gave us because the Bible says that we were created in the image of God. And he twists them into something that veers us and steers us away from who God has called us to be. We're in a battle. 
We have attacks against our soul that happen every single day. And there are many of you who are sitting in here this morning, you might be thinking, you know what, I'm going through exactly what you're talking about right now. I don't know what my future holds. I don't know what tomorrow's going to look like. I don't know how to deal with the situation I'm in. I, I have anxiety. I have fear. I have depression. I have, I, I just, this life is not anything that I imagined it would be. I remember that when uh, Megan and I got married and we started having kids, uh, I, t- I looked at her and I said, I used to always think that I would be the perfect, perfect husband and that I would be the perfect father. And I found out really fast, both weren't true. As a matter of fact, most days I feel like I'm the worst husband and I'm the worst father that anybody could ever have. I feel like a failure a lot of days. But I'm thankful that God gives me grace to continue on and to continue doing. And, and I just see the love of God in my family. Even though things aren't perfect and it's not always what we wish it would be and and we go through situations just like anybody else, I'm thankful for the grace of God that allows me to know that even though I don't always do what He's called me to do, He forgives me and I can get back up and I can walk forward in the power of Jesus Christ in my life. I'm thankful for that this morning, that I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to be the perfect husband. I don't have to be the perfect father. But what I do have to be is faithful. And I've got to be connected to what He's called me to do. And, and, and so I know that you might be sitting in here t- today and thinking, I don't think that I can make it out of this season of life. I don't think that I have a direction after this season is over or tomorrow when it comes. And, and the devil is throwing things in your face and speaking lies into your life. But I have come to declare this morning that you are a child of the living God. You might not realize it right now, but you are a child of the one true King. He is Alpha the beginning and Omega the end. There is no shadow or changing in Him. He is the God of light. He will reveal everything that you need to know if you turn your life over to Him. And I declare today that if you will submit to the promises that He has in the Word for you, if you submit and confess and believe that He will bring everything that you need to pass in your life. It may not look like you want it to. It may not be who you want it to. It may not be how you want it to. But He'll give you an answer that you need right on time. And I've come to declare something for somebody today. You have victory in the name of Jesus. You've been turned into all kinds of other things, all kinds of other people, all of your relationships, all of your trust that goes into yourself, and it's failed time after time. And you might be coming this morning for the very first time just to try out Remedy Church, just to see what's going on, just to see what kind of people are here. But I've got to tell you, it's more than what you imagined it would be. This is your divine appointment this morning to understand that you do not have to live a life that is mediocre because Jesus came to die so that you would be a powerful individual in the world and you could walk better, you could talk better, you could experience everything you experience in a new way. This is a divine appointment for somebody this morning. I don't take Sundays lightly. We could come in here and we could act like that this is just an agenda item because we meet every Sunday at 10.45 a.m. We know that we're going to sing songs and we know that there's going to be a message. But what I've got to tell you this morning is that if you look at it like that, you will never see Jesus move in your life. If you come together with the people of God and you worship Him because, hey, I've had a tough week, but right now I'm going to give it all to God, I guarantee you can walk out of here better than you walked in. If I give it all to God, I'm going to hear the message preached. And there might be an ugly old dude standing up behind a pulpit somewhere trying to preach at me. But I'm telling you, if you'll listen to what I have to say today, I believe that God will move in your life. And here's what I want you to get this morning. You might be walking through trouble, but that God will never give you an assignment He's not already supplied the resources for. God will never put you in a season that He's not already given you everything that you need to walk it out. He's never, he's never going to make a demand on you that He's not already supplied. God might give you more than you can handle on your own, but I'm going to tell you right now, the fact that you're walking in it tells me that He's going to bring you through it. I'm going to say that again because that was better than what you shouted for. I, 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 just, know, I just know that if you're walking through it, or if you're walking in it, He's going to bring you through it. That's better. He's going to bring you through it. I know that, that the end is, is going to meet me. I know that this season is going to end and another one is b- going to begin. But the devil wants to isolate you and make you think that there's nothing after this. He wants to isolate you. 
Fast forward from Genesis all the way to Acts. The same torment that the devil gave Adam and Eve, he was trying to play for Paul and Silas. He threw the book at them. He threw everything that he could think of at Paul and Silas. If you don't know what Acts says, go and read Acts. It's full of the movement of God. But right in the middle of a move of God, there is always chaos and trouble. Right in the middle of what God is trying to do, there's always confusion that the devil is trying to stir up in the lives of the people that are actually doing something for God. So let this be verification for you that if you're going through something and you feel like the enemy's attacking you, you might just be right on track with what God's calling you to do. But the story of Paul and Silas, at this point, Paul had split up with a companion by the name of Barnabas. They had a, a spat. They had an argument. They had a disagreement over something. And they decided, they went, to, they went on in unity. Understand that. They didn't split off and one of them fall off or whatever. They went on in unity to preach the gospel and do what God had called them to do. But they split because they had a disagreement. And in that moment, I know it would have been easy for Paul just to sit back and think, well, I don't have anybody doing this with me. I'm all alone. Kind of like Elijah in 1 Kings 19. He said, I'm all alone. There's nobody left but me. He could have said that. But I'm here to tell you today that uh, in moments where depression can creep in and tell you that you're alone and that you feel loneliness, God always provides a companion. Look at Scripture. There, anytime you see a called person, they're feeling lonely, they're feeling down. For every Paul, there's a Silas. For every David, there's a Jonathan. For every Abraham, there's an Isaac. For every Moses, there's an Aaron. Right? There's always something and somebody that God will send into your life. And you've got to be able to, to, to think about the context of where you are. Because if you lose the context of where you are and you start to say, well, I'm alone and God, I'm trying to do this, but I feel like it's not worth it because nobody's here with me. And, and I, I just, I want to remind you this morning, there's a man named Jesus that said that he would never leave you nor forsake you, that he'll be with you until the coming of the end of the days, that he's always there. And you're saying, well, Pastor, that's really far off and super spiritual, man. I can't get with that. Assess your relationships this morning. I can guarantee you there's somebody in your life that God has sent to build you up. I can, I can guarantee that if you stop and you just look around, there's somebody in your life that you can trust in, that you can, that you can have some camaraderie with. Because I know this, that when depression creeps in and when things come in to try to cast your soul down, God will always supply whatever need that you have. Understand that if God has called you to do something, He will bring about the resources to make it happen. If you struggle with depression and you submit your life to God, you've got to know that God has got this and He's going to take care of you. If you struggle with anxiety, God's going to send you somebody to help balance you out. I look at um, my marriage, for instance. I go back to me and Megan. I'm the dreamer. Okay? I'm the faith person. I'm the one that looks at crazy situations. I go, yeah, let's do that. And my wife's going, there ain't no way we can do that. And it's not because she doesn't have little faith. It's how she's designed. It's because she, she looks at things a different way than I do. And I know that without her, I'd be off on cloud nine somewhere, dreaming up a big this, that, and the other, and it'd never get done because I'm over there dreaming and, and all of that. And, but my wife comes in and she says, well, did you think about that you need this and you need this and you need this? And you need... She's a type A personality. She has lists for her lists. Okay? But without her, my life, my calling, my ministry would not be what it is if it wasn't for her life, her calling, and her ministry. And for every Paul, there's a Silas. And, for, and we were created to be connected. You've got to put your life in the context of how God has designed you for you to be able to overcome things like anxiety and depression. God made a, a statement in the beginning of all this. It's not good that man should be alone. And it was then that He provided... Eve for Adam. You look down all through Scripture and God has worked it out for connectedness to continually be a theme in Scripture. And I don't always know what the next step is. And I'm finding out more and more as, as I lead our church and as I lead the life that God has called me to that I need other people. 
This is why the church is so beautiful. This is why the people of God and being a part of a church is so beautiful. It's because your life is enriched by the church. Or it should be. I just believe, look, Remedy Church is not a perfect church. We're not a perfect, I don't know a perfect family out there. You know, even the poster families have issues, right? I got a couple of picture frames in my office that I'm not filled up with my family photos, and it's still the model families, you know? And I think it was Brother Jim walked in a couple of weeks ago, and he said, oh, that's a nice picture of your family right there. And I said, Brother, I'm going to lose about 70 pounds to look like that. But there's no perfect family. There's nobody in this world that's going to be able to, to, to come together and everybody agree all the time and everything be good and everybody just flow and go and it'd be all right. But I'm going to tell you that God supplies grace to a church that when people come together and they're hurting and they're broken, that it doesn't matter what our disagreements are. It doesn't matter what our differences are. It don't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter uh, what your background is. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what your past sins were. All I know is that Jesus is in this place. And when Jesus is in this place, all things become equal under that name. Because it's that name that cancer is stopped. It's that name that deliverance happens. It's that name that people find salvation. It's that name that will bring you into heaven. It's that name that you can put trust in. And I might not always be able to trust in Pastor Alex, but I know I can trust in Jesus. And I love Pastor Alex, and I know I can trust in him. But he's going to miss the mark because he's human. But the beautiful thing about a church is that when we come together, something very powerful happens. And Paul and Silas, they were on this journey. And if the devil was going to attack them, he should have put Paul on one side of the city and Silas on another one. Because when the, when we come together and the church begins to release a sound into the atmosphere, when we're singing praise and worship, it's not just about singing words on the screen. It's about releasing a sound into the atmosphere. Because the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I want to speak life at every turn. And when I come together, I don't want to come to a church that's speaking death, doom, and despair. I want to worship God with everything I am. And if I shout, I shout. If I jump, I jump. If I run, I run. Whatever it is, Jesus just be glorified. Because I know that if I lift Him up, He'll draw us all together. And that's what we were created for. That's what I was created for. I love worship. I love music. I love singing. I love playing guitar or, or piano or drum, whatever it is. God's, God's blessed me and He's gifted me to be able to do different things to, to worship Him and exalt Him. But I'm going to tell you that I don't have to sing a song to worship Him. I don't, I don't have to do anything but just to sit in His presence and submit to Him and say, God, my life is Yours. You lead me and You direct me where I need to go. Some of you might be feeling lost this morning. Some of you might, might need to sit down in the lap of Jesus and just say, what do you want from me today? What do you want from my life? I'm realizing more and more as this man at the front of the room begins to speak that my life is meant for more than what it has been to this point. And some of you might be feeling lost, but I know a Jesus that can point you in the right direction. The breast depression will come in and it will tell you that you're alone. But God will never leave you alone. He's always got a companion for you, even if the only companion is Him. Depression says you're alone, but God supplies a companion. Depression, it'll tell you, like it was telling Paul and Silas here in verse 25, that you're being punished because of who you are. Depression will come into your life and it will isolate you, and it will tell you that what you're experiencing in your life is because it's your identity. You're not worth anything. Nobody wants you. This life is all there is. There's no purpose to it. He'll come in and He'll whisper lies to you. And He'll tell you, you don't look like you're supposed to look. You, you, you can't be anything for God because of what you used to do. He'll whisper lies into your life and tell you that you can't have success in your life. You just aren't skilled enough. You're just not talented enough. You, you, you are your circumstance. That's what He preaches to you. You are your situation. 
Some of us, he's saying, you are your disease. Some of us, he's saying, you are your problem. And he comes in and he speaks and he whispers lies because he knows that God comes in and he tries to come in in a still, small voice. And he tries to, because the devil is not a creator, he's an imitator, he tries to look as much like God as he he can. And he'll come into your life and he'll try to speak things that sound like God, but lead you down a path that's completely wrong and God never intended for you. He'll make the path look pretty with roses and he'll pave it for you. And he'll, he'll, he'll lead you down to a place that looks really good for it to only be a mirage for what you thought you needed. Anybody ever watch Bugs Bunny? I love it because my son's watching Looney Tunes now. You know, we, we were, uh, and we still are kind of in the little Einsteins and all that, those little shows. Everybody in here, if you're a parent of young children, you know the songs and the theme songs of all the shows, right? But we've, we've kind of started to move into Looney Tunes, and I love that because that's what I watched growing up. And um, there's always this cartoon where Bugs Bunny's in the desert. And he start, he's in there so long, he starts seeing things, an oasis off in the distance. And he starts running for it. And as thirsty as he is, as desperate as he is to get water, he's running, he's running, and he gets there, and all of a sudden, he goes to jump in the puddle, and he lands in sand, and he's eating sand and drinking sand. It's because a mirage happened. He hallucinated it because he was in a place that made him feel like that he wanted to cling to whatever he saw first in front of him. I know it's funny to think about Bugs Bunny in a serious and spiritual way. But bear with me for a moment. And I thought about that as we were watching cartoons the other day, and I thought to myself, you know, a lot of Christians get this idea that whatever looks good, whatever feels good, and whatever's in front of them has been placed there because God put it there. A lot of Christians think that whatever I'm experiencing, whatever uh, my life looks like, it's what Jesus meant for me. That if I'm here and I'm doing it, and, and we, we, take, we take people who come to an altar and they say a prayer and they go back out into their lives and the same problems exist and the things don't go away that they were dealing with before and they're depressed and they're downcast because they weren't prepared to deal with the fact that just because you know Jesus doesn't mean that your life is going to be an oasis full of everything that you would need so you'll never thirst or what, whatever, you know. You'll you'll never have need, you'll never have hunger and all of that. Paul said that whatever I had need of, whether I'm empty or I'm full, whether I'm thirsty or I have drink or I have food or I'm hungry, whatever it is, I've learned to be content. And we send people back out into the world and say, okay, you're saved now, go ahead. But I can't tell you the kind of people that walk into my office and they say, I just don't know what to do. They come in and they say, I don't know how to deal with this. They call me tears. I can hear tears in their eyes and their throats swelling up because they don't know what else to try. They've talked to everyone they know to talk to. They've prayed and they've not seen an answer. They, they, they feel like, that everything that they try, everything that, well, Pastor, you said that if I'm, that if I'm just faithful and, and people keep telling me if I just submit it to God, it'll happen. And, and, and I, I, just, I just don't know what to do. And there's a thing that we never talk about in church called perseverance. There's a thing about uh, uh, perseverance that you need to know is that it is integral to the life of a Christian. It's, a, it's the most important part that you can ever have to your Christian life is perseverance. Knowing how when life comes at you and knocks you down, how to get back up and keep moving forward. Knowing how when situations come in that you don't know how to handle, you turn and you look at God and you go, okay, now what? You said that you would be with me. You said that you would never leave me, God. You said that if I acknowledge you in all my ways, that you'll make my path straight. So, okay, God, I don't know what to do with it. I'm handing it to you. But what happens is, in the middle of our circumstance, the devil squeaks his way into a little crack of our lives, and we forget to turn to God, and we continue to look at the circumstance, and that circumstance becomes the thing that we worship, an idol in our lives, and it becomes something that we identify with, and we begin 
to say, well, uh, you know, I, I have cancer, or I am, I, I'm, I'm stricken with cancer, or I'm stricken with a disease, or I'm stricken with addiction. I, I, I'm an addict. I am this. I am that. And it becomes who we are. I am a patient. I am this. I am that. And, and, and we speak that language into the spiritual realm. And if death and life are in the power of the tongue, and you're speaking, I am this and I am that, your identity soon becomes your circumstance that God never intended for it to be. And depression will come in, and it'll tell you that you're being punished because that's the way that God just meant it. We've got all kinds of people saying all kinds of things. We've got Christians arguing over free will versus predestination. We've got Christians arguing over who the best presidential candidate would have been because we think that somehow that whoever was in that office was going to fix things for us. We've got people arguing all kinds of different points all over the place, and we have nowhere to turn because we're not looking at Jesus, we're looking at the circumstance. And depression will creep in and it will tell you that you are what you're experiencing. The devil tries to make your situation concern how God feels about you. But God doesn't place you in situations that you'll find yourself falling away from Him. God does not tempt you into sin. God will not put you into places where He will find you not wanting to be with Him anymore. Look, God pursued you from the moment that, it's, that, that time began. From the moment that He created the earth, He thought of you. Why would He put you in a situation where He knew you would fall away and end up going to hell and die and spend an eternity there whenever He spent thousands of years pursuing your heart? Why would He send His Son Jesus to live 33 years on the earth just for the simple act of dying on a cross and returning back to heaven and doing all of that? And yes, it was simple to Him, but it was too great for us. You have to understand that God has invested way too much in you to let you fall away. You can choose to walk away from Him. That doesn't diminish how much He loves you. You can choose your addiction. It doesn't diminish how much He loves you. You can choose your problem. It doesn't diminish how much He loves you. You can be who you want to be, but He still has a purpose and a design for you to fulfill in this earth. Am I talking to somebody this morning? He's designed you for something. God's very purposeful in everything that He does. He doesn't bring you to places where you fall away, but God's all about positioning and repositioning. And He sees your life, and wherever you are, even though He doesn't cause that thing to come in your life to fall away, what He does is He'll use that thing to, to present an opportunity to position you where you need to be to go to the next place in Him. So listen, Christian, if you feel alone and like God has left you, He's not left you. He's just positioning you. He's work, God, God's quiet when He works. God, is, God doesn't speak as much when He's trying to move and shift things around. He, he's not talking because He's working. You know, I, we got a lot of people that like to talk more than they like to work. We got a lot of people that like to say things and not do things. We got a lot of people that like to talk the talk and not walk the walk. We got a lot of people that like to dress a certain way and act a certain way and come up in the church and act like I'm perfect and I got it all together. But you go home and you got all kinds of crazy mess going on. And you got you're making people feel awful. And you got a bitter spirit and you got a critical spirit. But God is calling a generation to rise up and say, It's not about what I wear, it's not about who I am, it's about who he is. It's not about my past. It's about who he is. It's not about what the devil tricked me into before. It's about where God's taking me to now. He's looking for a generation to rise up. So the devil goes after your identity with depression. You ever wondered how Paul and Silas in verse 25 it just pops up and says, at midnight, they were singing hymns. Okay. I don't know. Well, let me put it. I, I don't know a lot of prisoners, period. But I don't know of a lot of stories of prisoners either where they're just happy and joyful sitting in that cell. 
I don't know. I don't know a lot of stories about people. I, I've never heard much about people singing in the middle of prison about how good God is. Matter of fact, I've heard a lot of ministers who minister in prisons. They say, "Man, it's, it's one of the toughest things that you could ever do." Hardened hearts and souls in there, and you're preaching to them, and they're not making a they're not making a sound. They're just staring straight ahead. And it's a tough thing. You know, you know, they're not sitting in the cells just rejoicing over what God's done in their life. And I always thought about that in this story is that the Scripture, it doesn't talk much about what happened between the time they were put in prison and midnight, but what I do know is that they were put in prison and God thought it important enough for them to skip straight to midnight and start saying, you know what? Paul and Silas were singing. Paul and Silas were in trouble, but they were singing. And it says that they were singing hymns and all the prisoners could hear what they were doing. And I've always wondered why it was that Paul and Silas could be singing in the inner prison. The dark, dirty, nasty inner prison. No chance of getting out. Layers upon layers of hallways and doors to go through before that they could get to the outside. They put them deep, dark, into a well of a prison so that they couldn't get out. And the devil basically positioned them to try and say, you're never going to preach the gospel again. But Paul and Silas found themselves in the middle of the inner prison and they began to sing. And it was because they didn't know what else to do. All they knew was that this circumstance didn't define what God had done in their life. And they found themselves in a circumstance that was hopeless and despair and depressed. And you don't know that you'd ever make it out of it, but they just began to sing because they did know something about Jesus is that he said he'd never leave them. And they knew something about Jesus that he was faithful. And they knew something about Jesus that when he was around and he touched somebody, their eyes began to see, their ears began to hear, their legs got strong again. And they took up a bed they laid on for 30 years and started walking again. They knew something about this man Jesus that no matter what the situation looked like when he was there, the atmosphere changed and something was about to break. And depression will creep in and it will tell you that what you're experiencing is your circumstance. But I have to submit to you today, if you will just remember who you are in God, in the middle of your mess, you will come through it and you'll be singing all the way home. If you could just get to a place where you understand who you are. The problem is, a lot of people never figure out who they are. They never take the plunge, if you will. We got people that walk in and out of churches. We got people that walk by each other in the supermarket. We got pe- people that walk by each other on a day-to-day at their job, at their school, at their w- whatever, whatever you're at. And we don't talk about Jesus because now today in society it's taboo. And we don't talk about Jesus today because now there are rules in place where you can't. And we don't talk about Jesus and the enemy has launched an attack on this generation to silence the gospel so that people never figure out who they are. That's why suicide rates are higher than they have ever been. It's because depression is taking over on people and they think that their situation and their circumstance is who they are. That's why teenagers are killing themselves now more than they ever have. That's why bullying bullying is at an all-time high. That's why we have all of these things going on. It's because the gospel is being silenced by the tactics of the enemy and the people of God are letting it happen. If you're here today, I would be doing God a disservice not to tell you that you were created more for what you're living right now. Jesus came and died for you so that you could be who He called you to be. And when He created, the Bible says that He knit you and formed you in your mother's womb. That tells me that before I came to the earth, I existed in eternity, and I was up on God's turntable, and He was molding me, and He was making me into what I would be one day. And it might take me time to get there, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Every day He's molding me, and He's making me into what He wants me to be. And depression in those moments will creep in, and they'll tell you, it'll tell you, you'll never get there. You'll never be it. Things might be looking really good right now, but just wait. Tomorrow something's going to happen. But just wait. Your your family's still... You you might be doing all this stuff, but you ain't doing nothing to fix your family. 
You might be doing all this stuff, but look, that job ain't going nowhere for you. It's dead end. Look, uh, tragedy's about to strike you. Anything could happen tomorrow, and he does what he can to depress you and push you down. And depression will tell you you're lonely. God will, will supply a companion. Depression will tell you that you're being punished because that's just who you are. But God comes in and He tells you that you are His child. And He comes in and He identifies who you are if you'll allow Him to. But here's the thing, church. If we're ever going to overcome times of depression, if we're ever going to overcome... If you're ever... Bring it home. Be personal this morning. If you're ever going to get past this season, you need to remember who He said you were. And you need to release a sound into the atmosphere. There are two things that I know. That you were always and forever created to be a son or a daughter of Jesus. Of God. Of the Most High King. You were always created to be royalty. And the second thing that I know is that the Bible says that He's enthroned in the praises of His people. That God inhabits the praises of His people. And so if, he can si- if the devil can silence me, he can take away God's presence from my life. But if I wake up and I make a decision that no matter what comes my way, no matter what obstacles may come, no matter what anybody says to me, no matter what my circumstance tells me, no matter what my skills lack, no matter who is or who isn't here, I can trust that Jesus is good and His mercies are new every morning and I'm going to give Him praise that's due His name. Because without Him, I'd be dead. Without Him, I wouldn't be saved. Without Him, I'd be going to hell for eternity. Without Him, I wouldn't have a choice But because of Jesus, I am alive. Jason Jason Crabb said, He never promised that the cross would not get heavy and that He would not be hard to climb. He never offered our victories without fighting, but he said help would always come in time. Well, just remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says give in, just hold on. Our Lord's going to show up. You better know He'll show up. He will show up. He'll take you through the fire again. Stand to your feet this morning. today, if anything that I have said has resonated with your spirit, and you walked in here downcast this morning because of a person, circumstance, or situation in your life, I want you to come and find a place in this altar. I don't want you to waste time. I don't want you to think about it. You know your situation, and if you have a situation that you've been downcast over this morning, God's in the house. I need my elders to come and and begin to pray if you're available. I need prayer warriors in the altar to begin to pray. If that's you this morning and you you, you felt a a depression, a pressing down, an isolation, if you felt alone in your circumstance, this morning is your morning to claim victory over whatever circumstance that you've got going on in your life. Don't wait. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't let the devil talk you out of it this morning. I need more prayer warriors. I need some ladies to come help me pray this morning. I need some ladies to come help me pray this morning. God is waiting on someone to submit to the moment today. He's waiting on someone to submit to the moment today. 
It's time for victory in the house. It's time for victory in your life. It's time for victory in your circumstance. I'm going to wait another moment if that's you. And you need to come and you need prayer this morning. Maybe it's for something different. Maybe it's a circumstance that you don't know how to deal with. Maybe you're lost and you have no direction and you need clarity and guidance from God. And you know that this is a moment the devil could come in and he could trick you into thinking that you're all alone in this moment. You need guidance from God. Come and find a place in this altar and let's pray and let's get some direction from God this morning. Hallelujah.
But uh, at 5.30 p.m., if you're interested in any of those things, sound booth, computer, safe design, lighting, anything that you see on our campus when you come into our building, if you, if you want to be a part of that, come tonight at 5.30 p.m. Or if you just are interested to see what we're doing as a church and where we're going, 5.30 p.m. will be 24 to double. Am I forgetting anything? Fall Festival is this Saturday, the 28th, from 3.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. We'll have a truck retreat for the first hour. Uh, there will be games, a hay ride, uh, free food. Who likes free food? Yeah? Free food. We've got all that stuff. Uh, there's going to be face painting and some other things. So come out and bring your whole family. Join us. It's going to be a great time. Let me pray for us as we go out. Father, it's in the name of Jesus we come before you. And we thank you for what you've done today, God. We believe in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus to do things, God, that we can't do, that we have faith in him. We have faith in you, God, to bring us through our situations, to overcome feelings of depression and anxiety and fear, God. We just trust you with our life, God. And I pray that you would touch each and every person. Bless them and give them favor, God. Bring us back together. To to worship you in spirit and in truth and help us to be a witness to you in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. We'll see you, on, we'll see you tonight at 530 or on Wednesday at 7.